All right, this morning we're going to look at a lesson entitled Pay Attention. It's from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> Here the Hebrew writer says, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and that's angels there is the uh, human messengers, prophets of the Old Testament, proved to be reliable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It, this great salvation, was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, the apostles, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. And that's where we come to, while well, we're talking about the prophets of the New Testament in our Bible class this morning. But the lesson for today is, from that first part, pay attention. For a moment, I want you to think about something. There are places along the seashore where waves come crashing in so powerfully that if a ship gets caught on the shore, where these waves are coming in, it, it can be destroyed. Yet perhaps just a few miles away, there might be a port or a marina where all sizes of ships, boats, little boats, big boats may be docked, and the water's only rising or falling just a few inches. Notice that? You know, places like on the west coast, uh, you have Long Beach Port, of course, it's kind of backed up right now with ships and all. But, uh, but just a few miles north of there, you have beaches where the surfers are out there riding the waves right into the shore. So what is it? Why, well, why do you have such two distinct, two drastically different effects in such a small area? And the answer, of course, is the existence of a harbor, whether it's natural or man-made. Now. Guess what we got? We got pictures today. There's a harbor. Hmm? Yeah, that's a harbor. And in the first century AD, uh, most of the harbors along the Mediterranean were man-made because there are not many natural harbors on the Mediterranean Ocean. So if you were in a city like uh, along the east coast there of the Mediterranean and your city, your state, uh, country built a harbor, you could get a lot of trade coming in there and made you a very prosperous city. Harbors were built and maintained to encourage commerce. The most important part of a harbor is the seawall. See, out here and over there and the reason why is because it stood off from the shore and took the intense beating of the waves. Now, you can't see too many waves out here, too much beating. You imagine if a storm come along, that's where the waves would really beat along this sea wall. When the sea was calm, it was easy for the ship to sail right into the port up here through the sea lane, right? When the, uh, if the sea was stormy, the waves could push the ship past that sea lane if they weren't careful. The wind was coming out of the north, you push them over here and they'd hit and the waves would tear them up. Out of the south, boom, over there. Or west, boom, push them right in to that. And of course we know the Apostle Paul was shipwrecked on an island. It wasn't a port there, and we, we know the effects of that. It just tore that ship up. Now, the ship's crews were skilled at bringing ships into the port in any weather. If it was stormy, they could still get them in there because they knew what to do, and they used every tool available. They had their rudders, they had the sails, they had the anchors, they had the oars, and they would use them when lifting the, uh, like if they would, it was storming, they'd come into here, they'd drop their anchors and maybe stop and adjust their sails till they got lined up perfectly, then they'd pick their anchors up just a little bit off the bottom so they could ease into that little place to get back here where the waters would be calmer. 
So uh, if they had to, they'd row. If they had that capability, lots of things that they could do. Uh, once inside the seawall, again, the waters would be calm. The big swells and the waves would not harm the ship anymore. Just to let you know ahead of time, though, the wind could still affect them. Okay, Their problems weren't totally over, but we'll hit that down near the end of the lesson. So, <clears throat> the Hebrew writer seems to have been familiar with nautical terminology. If both Paul and Luke were on the ship that was shipwrecked that we learn about in the book of Acts, and I think Paul even says that maybe he was shipwrecked more than once, being on the ships and stuff and listening and learning, they'd learn some of the uh, terminology that was used. They'd know the technology, but they'd learn the terminology also. And the Hebrew writer seems to be familiar with that. Therefore, we must pay, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Heard what? He's talking to Christians. He's talking about disciples of Jesus Christ. We have to pay attention most more closely to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Well, that's the gospel that the apostles were teaching. It came from Jesus. Uh, uh, the apostles were teaching it. Those prophets of the New Testament were teaching it. Oh, well, what's he saying here? Well, pay much closer attention is from a Greek word, prosekin, prosekain, I guess is proper, which means to bring a ship to land and simply to touch at or to put in. You know, here's the the pier or the wharf, whatever, and you want that ship to come in and just ride up beside it, all right? And then they throw the ropes and they tie it over and bring it real close. Well, that's, that's what you want to do, and that's pay closer attention. Let's, let's get it right there, close as possible. The sailors had to be alert to do their jobs correctly in threatening circumstances, again, uh, all this had to go together correctly when you're talking about hitting that sea lane, getting over there to the docks correctly. Uh, they were to be more alert because it wasn't just the ship that was at stake. Their lives could be at stake. Drift away is literally let slip from para -hayo, meaning to let the slip let the ship slip past the point where it is supposed to stop. And that's more directly in that that port, that pier area, the wharf area. You don't want it to, the wind to catch it and push it on by. We've probably all seen uh, pictures. There, there have been a few times when some of these big ferry boats, like in New York City or I believe in Seattle, Washington, where these big boats carrying passengers and cars, you know, they do it how many times a day, you know, crossing the river, crossing a sound, and they come in and something goes wrong and they run right into the pier, boom, and cause so much damage and sometimes loss of life because they weren't being careful, because those boats don't stop on a dime, do they? And they don't turn on a dime. They just keep on going. So if the ship slipped past the sea lane, it could be crushed in the surf, and if it came in too fast, it could crash into the docks. So, you know, out on the sea was one thing, but here's where they really had to pay much closer attention, just like the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying here. Notice how the Hebrew writer connects all of this to a disciple's faith. A disciple's faith. If we do not drop our spiritual anchor in the word of God, we will miss the spiritual harbor of our salvation, the Lord's church. We, we got to slow down and make sure we hear, believe, and obey the gospel. Or we're going to crash out on the shore somewhere. And notice the word neglect in verse 3 is an apposition to more earnest heed in verse 1. 
if we neglect so great a salvation, why would we neglect it? Because we're not paying attention, right? Right? Yeah. Uh, you know, how many accidents occur out here because somebody's not paying attention? And really, it is a sense of neglect. Accidents can happen. I mean, anyway. but, but most of the time, it, it's a neglect deal. The Word of God is reliable or steadfast, and that's what verse 2 is talking about, right? Right? Uh, as opposed to shifting like the sea. You know, underneath the sea, underneath a lake, underneath a pond, uh, underneath a mud puddle out here anywhere, you know what's underneath that? Solid ground. There's solid ground underneath it. Uh, there's solid ground here, but up here, the, the, the sea, the water, you know, it's kind of unstable. You, you can't walk on a pond. Now, Jesus could, <laughs> but he was special. But you can't walk on, on a pond because it's unstable. Every storm of life, behind every storm of life, is God's instructions for our blessedness. He, he gives us in, in the Bible. If, if this is happening in your life, here, here's kind of, you know, a, I won't say a solution to the problem, but a way through it. So in the end, everything's going to be all right. Okay? Everything's going to be all right if, if you listen to God's instructions. If we don't heed God's instructions, what happens? <laughs> it will be like the ship that they weren't paying attention and it gets shipwrecked. You know, sometimes paying attention, that paying attention is just getting the weather report. I pay more attention now to the 10-day forecast than I ever did before. You know, what's, what's going to be happening in the next... What, what does, I know it, it could be hit or miss 10 days out, but I, I want to know, what's the weather going to be like in the next 10 days? No rain for the next 10 days, right? Now, I haven't really looked close today, but so I know some things are going to happen, you know need to happen. But God says be aware. Be aware of the surroundings. And if you're aware of the surroundings, it's less likely that something terrible is going to catch up with you. This spiritual harbor, the, the spiritual harbor is the Lord's church. Now how do I know that? Because it's built on solid rock. Now, there may be solid rock here and come up out of the ocean. That's what an island is, isn't it? An island's built on solid rock. It's coming up, and here's an ocean, or here's a sea, whatever. But there it is, and, and it's pretty solid. But it's, it, it's built on a rock. It, it, it's there, and that's what the church is. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. To, Take hell being all those wind and waves and the storms and everything out here, but here's the rock, here, here's that island, that's that place of safety. And if you're there, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. And, and that's not just the church. That, that's listening to the instructions. That's, that's taking care of what we need to take care of when we need to take care of it. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 25 goes in perfectly with this. He says to the disciples there, but you have come to Mount Zion. What's an island? It's a mountain out in the middle of the sea, isn't it? And you're just looking at the top of it. You've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn, Hold on to that. We're going to catch that in a moment. Who are enrolled in heaven and to God and the judge of all. I'm sorry. And to God, the judge of all. And to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. 
and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, he says, you've come to these, but remember that picture of the harbor? <laughs> There's a way to get to those, okay? And you gotta pay attention to it. Verse 25, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. And that's not me, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't refuse him who's speaking. He's the one that gave the gospel. For if they do not escape when they re for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will they escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. If we're not doing what the Lord Jesus Christ has instructed us to do, there's no escape. There's no escape. We're gonna crash. But notice that, the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, assembly is from the, that Greek word ekklesia, which means the, the congregating together, but it's the word that's used for church. It's translated church. Firstborn is prototokos, and the firstborn is Christ. That's Jesus. He's the first. He's the only begotten Son of God. So the assembly of the firstborn. What is that? It's the Church of Christ. The church that He built. Matthew sixteen eighteen. On this rock I will build my church. Now a lot of people have built churches. A lot of people. But Jesus built his church. And he's left instructions how we can be a part of his church. He's told us how to get into the sea lane, so to speak, and into the harbor safely. Even in the harbor. Even in the harbor. The sailors had to give the more earnest heed to their actions. The Hebrew writer did not want disciples to become lazy or neglectful. The anchors remained down for added maneuverability in the congested area. You, you imagine you got this, this harbor and there might be a hundred ships and they're making their way in and out of port, right? So they're coming into port. Of course, they got rules, right? You know, when we're driving down the highway, you, you drive on the right side of the road. People coming the other way, drive on the right side. Pass, you know, everything. You work things out. But it's, again, it's a congested area. There's winds. There might be currents within there. What, what do they call those? Uh, rip tides and stuff. You know, you just never know. You got to be careful. So they leave their anchors. They just pick them up a little bit off the floor. And they know the depth of the water, right? Mark Twain. You know, just, they're being careful to get in there. And they take great care maneuvering through those congested areas. And the sailors take a great care of tying their ships to the pier because the slightest wind, slightest change in current can cause a loose ship to drift in the harbor. Remember the World War II deal, loose lips? Uh, every now and then a barge will get loose on the Mississippi River when there's a, a flood and it'll hit a bridge or something. They'll have to tear the whole bridge down, right? You can imagine what it'd do to another ship. Uh, a loose ship can crash into a pier. We, we talked about that. You know, those ferry boats, boom! So the Hebrew writer gives at least three important, more earnest heed instructions as he goes on through the book of Hebrews. Okay? And this is for disciples of Jesus Christ. Number one, we need to be diligent students of God's Word. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. The Hebrew writer talks about milk and meat. And there's a time when we need to be moving from milk to meat. 
Do you know what milk is? Predigested food. Mama cow eats grass, right? Converts that into milk and feeds the baby, the calf, right? But eventually that calf needs to grow up and start eating grass itself. Well, the same thing with human beings, right? Mama eats a steak and feeds the baby. <laughs> but at some point, that baby needs to eat steak itself. It's smart. It'll want steak. Okay. As Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to be able to pick up the Bible and read it and study it on our own so we know what it says, so that nobody like Fred can deceive us. Right? Can I hear an amen? Amen. Amen. You don't want Fred to deceive you. No, don't take my word for it. You open it up. Secondly, we need it to be in the company of other disciples. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 20, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the habit of some is. Why? This is where we gain some strength and encourage one another. And the Lord wants us to be here. Three, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Well, he's the great harbor master, isn't he? He's the one that's laid out the rules for that harbor that says, now here's how all these ships can run around out here in this harbor and get to the piers and unload and load and do this and get in and out, all this safely. In harmony, like a song. I think I've got a, a, uh, a sermon coming up here not too long. Uh, you are a poem. <laughs> You'll like it. But it's like an orchestra playing. When things are going good, when things are organized, when things are going properly, the way the great harbor master has designed it, what a wonderful thing. But you throw in somebody that wants to do it their way, somebody that doesn't want to pay attention, somebody that isn't paying attention, and you know what you got? You got chaos. You got chaos. And then you got catastrophe. Hmm. Conclusion. Always the best part of my sermons. Yes. The words of Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, are as relevant for us today as they were for those who made shipwreck of their faith and were delivered over to Satan in the first century. What? You mean there were disciples? People who were saved? who then were lost? Yes. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. This I charge, this, I'm sorry, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, by rejecting what? Well, it's the faith, right? Uh, the faith that contained those prophecies. Uh, the faith that, that gives a person a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Oh, could, could the Apostle Paul do that? Apparently... So here were some disciples who weren't paying attention, or if they were paying attention, they did this on purpose. They rejected the faith 
and they made shipwreck of their faith. How terrible. Is your faith slipping? That's a question for you to answer. Have, have you failed to give the more earnest heed? You're just going along, you know, whatever happens, happens. Well, you need to find God's safe harbor this morning if that's the case. But, you know, it's there. <clears throat> it's there. God's patient. Uh, he's waiting. He's waiting. So, that's the lesson for today. If you have a need, please come forward. Take a seat here in the front as we stand and sing.